Share again. Very good. <clears throat> So, these are the lecture notes. I already put them there. So, uh, let's use them. All right, so these are our three axes. Uh, we have rolling, pitching, and yaw moments, and we have stability requirements about the three axes. And we have identified a major part of the airplane or a major contributor to, the, to this stability. So here is the dihedral angle uh, for CM alpha negative pitch stability. Uh, it's the horizontal tail for CN beta yaw stability, directional stability is the vertical tail. So uh, now let's see. So this is part two. So I'm um, just as a motivate motivation for part two. Let's consider this example. I have a an airplane in the wind tunnel. So. This is exaggeration. So this is the wing. This is the CG. But the CG is on a hinge. Maybe you can do like this. Stress the fact that the airplane can rotate around this thing. So this is in the wind tunnel. Okay. So the flow comes like this horizontally. E is free stream velocity u infinity so uh, this is the x-axis of the body xb this is z b um, maybe a different color you guys are expert in this anybody can say what is this angle angle of attack Yes, exactly. So this is uh, where we can view two two ways. One angle between the x axis of the airplane and horizontal. This is indeed uh, theta. And also aerodynamically, this is the angle between the wind v or u infinity and the cord. So uh, this is also from this point of view is our angle of attack alpha. That's fine. So this airplane as a body has just one degree of freedom in the wind tunnel. The degree of freedom that is theta or alpha, whatever you want to call it. So it's just a rotational degree of freedom. And if you want to write down the equation for a rotational degree of freedom, how do you write it? If you guys remember, it was I theta double dot equals the torque. Anyone that doesn't uh, accept this equation? Anyone has a question that this is the governing equation? An airplane is not free flying. It's just in the wind tunnel. So it's fixed. It doesn't move in any direction. It's just allowed to rotate. So this circle, black circle, goes through the uh, CG. And it allows the airplane to rotate about the CG. So we have just one rotational degree of freedom theta. The equation of motion for a single degree of freedom theta is Nothing can be simpler than this. So uh, it's simply I theta double dot equals the torque or the moment, whatever you want to call it. Any question about that? So let's use our language. So our language is this I because the airplane is a rigid body. So it has uh, three, actually it has many I's, but at least three axes, X, Y, Z. So there is I, I X, I, Y, I, Z. This rotation is about the y-axis, so I'm going to call this IY, okay? Again, theta double dot is equal to the torque. What type of torque or moment? Well, the airplane has three moments, L, M, N. What is this moment? This is the torque or moment about Y. We indeed call it M. So I'm going to 
This is my equation of motion. I Y theta double dot equals my pitching moment M that we use to compute from part one. Any question about this equation so far? Okay, and uh, you guys experts in this, this is one half row V squared is C bar of course, times the moment coefficient. And I need to expand the moment coefficient. How can I, how can we write the moment coefficient? Let's see the moment coefficient as we always do is simply CM naught plus CM alpha alpha plus CM delta delta and so on. So CM naught is the CM at zero angle for 10. So, uh, so this is CM naught plus CM alpha alpha plus CM delta delta and so on. So the point is here, we let, let's assume for the moment that at zero angle of attack we had balance so uh there was no moment at zero angle of attack. let's assume this for the moment so now i have theta double dot is equal to one half rho v squared is c bar c m alpha over i y times alpha plus there are expressions with delta elevator let's assume that i will not move my elevator for this motion i just let the airplane move freely without applying any elevator so this is indeed my equation of motion the last thing is that as you guys uh, can see from here is that this alpha is indeed my theta right so my equation of motion is simply theta double dot is equal to whatever we have here let's give it just a name any name i'm gonna name it m alpha because it's constant times cm alpha and it's not coefficient anymore because i'm multiplying with these things again it's a constant from one airplane to another it's just a constant so m alpha times theta this is my equation of motion any question about this equation of motion so my equation of motion is theta double dot equals some constant three four minus one minus two right it depends this is the m alpha what's m alpha it is given from this pink equation give me the geometry i can give you your m alpha okay any questions so far okay so uh, our equation is theta double dot equals a number three times theta x double dot equals a number three times x how we solve this equation well we know how to solve this equation this is a differential equation and it's linear coefficient it's linear with constant coefficient so the solution actually depends on the sign of m alpha if m alpha is positive then the solution is some constant times e to the negative square root m alpha t plus b times e to the square root m alpha t because m alpha is positive i can take the square root and i have exponential of the thing and exponential of negative the thing a and b are constants you get them from the initial condition initial disturbance so let, let's see let's let's pause a little bit and see what what's going on i have an airplane put it in the wind tunnel and the air is coming theta here represents the motion of the airplane okay and i'm interested to see how theta changes with time at the beginning at the beginning i did not have any cm notes i did not have any moment at the zero angle of attack so i'm starting at zero angle of attack and balance so the airplane is balanced in the horizontal position and i'm interested if to see what happens if just i give this a little disturbance just push it up and down give it some disturbance what will happen will the airplane blow up like theta increase all over the way and just flip or just after the disturbance, it will simply come back to its horizontal position, or it will keep oscillating indefinitely up and down, up and down. So I'm interested to see what happened. 
So, okay, how, how do you do that? Well, we write down the equation of motion and we just simply solve the equation of motion to get theta as a function of time, how theta will behave with time. Fine, let's look at these two terms. Can we sketch these two terms? This is exponential of negative something times t. How does this sketch? Well, this is easy. This is at t equals zero, it's e to the zero is one. So it's, it's here, so it's actually a, right? Our initial condition, this is theta versus time. And as t goes to infinity, e to the negative infinity is zero. So this actually decay is like this, very good. So my theta, if I give it some initial disturbance, it will decay with time and come back. But what about the second term? Let's see the second term. Because my total solution is the summation of, of two, of both of them. Again, e to the zero is one. So this is actually starting at b. But then what happened? e to the positive infinity is infinity. So it blows up. And you're adding the two solutions, one decays and the other one blows up so this means that the total theta will blow up you just touch it and it will theta will increase all the way and their plane will flip okay any question about that so this is if m alpha of their plane is positive any question If m alpha is negative on the other hand. Uh, sorry, I had a quick question. In lecture, I think you had the two reversed where you had b going down. I mean, is there really any real matter. indication? Okay. No, it does, doesn't matter, right? Okay. It's, it's any any constant here and any constant there. These a, a and b really depend on the initial disturbance that you give. It doesn't matter. Okay. But the, the final conclusion is the same, which is in this scenario, the airplane will blow up. If your m alpha is positive, the airplane will blow up, which kind of we know, right? Because what is m alpha? m alpha is this, these things multiplied by c m alpha. These things are just geometry and speed, so they are all positive. So indeed, m alpha will follow the sign of c m alpha. And we know from the beginning that c m alpha positive, the airplane is unstable. We know this from before, from the physics of light. Here we see it from mathematics. And so likewise, if m alpha is negative, it means that cm alpha was negative. And we know that this is stable. At least it will not blow up. So let's get it from mathematics. I have this purple equation. And this number is negative, negative 3, negative 2. What is the solution? Well, it's not exponential anymore because exponential of we, we cannot do square root of, of, of a negative thing. Or it will give you i and j. Uh, and the exponential will be cosine and sine. So the solution here is simply, if you recall your differential equation course, is simply cosine and sine. Again, another a cosine omega t, which is square root negative m alpha t plus b sine square root negative m alpha t. All right? So, uh, the solution is cosine and sine. Just give me the initial condition and uh, it actually will just oscillate indefinitely with time. So at least it's not blowing up. Any question? So now we recovered the notion that we already know that CM alpha must be negative for stability. We recovered it from this mathematical analysis. We wrote down the equation of motion for this single degree of freedom and uh, analyzed its solution. Any question? All right, so that's that's good. So we, we recovered this, we, we already knew this. One thing here to note that I must emphasize. This equation, again, this theta double dot is number times theta, is the same as x double dot is number times x. And we just agreed that this number is negative. So this equation looks exactly the same, will behave exactly the same like this red equation. And let me know if you have a question about that. And the question to you guys now is, 
what does this equation, red equation represent? X double dot equals negative KX. Spring, exactly. This is a mass spring system, right? Of unit mass. Mass equals one, and this is K. So you exactly have this system governed by this equation. So this is a good analogy, why? Because my airplane in flight or in the wind tunnel can be described by a mass spring system. And what does represent my spring? What is my K? My K is actually a alpha. So the fact that I have a negative C alpha, which coming from the horizontal tail, the fact that you have a horizontal tail here, once you have a strong enough horizontal tail, this gives you a spring action. And it is indeed called like this. It is called pitch stiffness. This CM alpha is called pitch stiffness, pitch spring. So having a horizontal tail like this, it's exactly equivalent to having a torsional spring with its constant K is equal to M alpha. This is a very important thing because if you want to, if you want to stabilize any motion, you must have a spring. Particularly in this course, we're going to talk about mass springs a lot because everything boils down really to mass spring system. At the end of the day, no matter how complicated the system is. So we need to deeply understand the mass spring system. If you have a mass spring system, if you have any mass and you want to stabilize it, what do you mean by stabilize it? We mean if you disturb it, if I push this mass to the right or to the left, what is the effect that will bring me to equilibrium again? Well, it's the spring. If I don't have a spring, nothing will resist to your disturbance, right? So by writing down this analogy, it really seems that my spring is M alpha or CM alpha. There is a constant multiple of each other. So my spring is simply a CM alpha. If you want to have a larger spring, have larger CM alpha. How? By having larger horizontal tail and so and so, okay? Any question about that? This is very important and I don't want you to not get it. You have to get this. This is one important thing. And I always ask about it in the final. <coughs> Questions about this? Um, you... So if our, out, if our co coefficient of moment term is based off of like some constant plus some constant times alpha, it seems like, does it, I mean, does that mean that our the biggest contributor to our restoring uh, moment or that coefficient moment would be like actual lift due to the airfoil because it's not the case for the horizontal tail since it's symmetric it's like purely like whatever the coefficient is caused it is, by it is the lift here this is the change in the lift here that really gives you this because this thing will will create a a restoring moment when you get an increase in the angle of attack and that's a pure function of our change in alpha though, right? Because the horizontal tail doesn't generate lift without exactly. a change and this in is, alpha. Exactly, and this is what I want. I want at the nominal alpha, I don't want any contribution. And if my alpha is increased or changed from the nominal condition, I want this thing to respond. This is exactly what I want, yeah. So it's not in the same node term, it's not in the same delta term, it is in the coefficient of alpha, the thing that is due to changes in alpha, okay? Okay, yeah, that clarifies it, thank you. Yep. Um, More questions? Yep. Hi, so I had a question regarding the uh, second case for the differential equation. Um, so kind of coming back, but what's the case when there's a damping coefficient? I'm, I'm coming to it. This is a very, very important point. Thank you. I'm, I'm coming to it in, in, in just a minute. Oh, okay. More questions about uh, the fact that this is my spring. All right, so let's see. So uh, back to this very important question. Well, does the airplane really will oscillate indefinitely like this in the winter? Of course not. In, not in flight and not in the winter. Why? Because we have friction. We always have friction. But if the friction is weak, we may take like an hour to come back. So uh, then this distinguishes between what we call static stability and dynamic stability. Okay. So these requirements, as you can see here in this table, these are the requirements. These are the requirements that we have been talking about so far. 
All these requirements are requirements for simply what we call static stability. What do you mean? Static stability means that we will not blow up if we got a disturbance. Okay, so if you have this kind of response, and uh, on the top of that, if there is a little bit of friction, you will decay whatever the time it takes. So the end of the day, my system will not blow up. So I am statically stable. What are these static stability requirements? Is simply that we have spring action. And what are the spring actions in your airplane? Well, for the pitching motion is CM alpha. What about the other things? Well, let's look at the spring. What is the nature of the spring? The nature of the spring is a force due to displacement, correct? Force due to displacement. This is the spring. So in the rotational version of it, it's a torque or moment due to an angle. So any restoring moment due to an angle in the same direction is a spring action. So this is why here it's moment M due to alpha or the coefficient of it, CM alpha. Indeed, CM alpha is the same as M alpha, it's just C stands for a coefficient by normalization. So if I have a moment M due to alpha and it's restoring, this is a spring. So CM alpha is my spring in the pitching direction. What about CL beta? Or CN beta, let's look at CN beta here. Remove the C because it's just coefficient. So it's N beta. N beta is yaw moment due to a yaw angle, and it's restoring CN beta is indeed my spring in the yaw motion. L beta, again, is my spring in the roll motion. And we call them like this. This is CL beta, is the roll stiffness. CM alpha is the pitch stiffness or spring. CN beta is the yaw stiffness or spring. Any question about that? These are very important notions uh, that you guys must get, that these are my spring actions. They will tend, they, they will behave exactly the same as a spring and will tend the airplane to uh, come back to its equilibrium. At least they will not blow up. So the mere existence of a spring gives you static stability. What do we mean by static stability? That my system will not blow up it will eventually come back to its equilibrium due to the, the indispensable, the li little friction that must be there. Okay. Now, it will come back to my equilibrium because of the little friction, but I may not be satisfied by the way it is coming back. Indeed, if an airplane takes an hour to come back, I will not be satisfied, right? So now it comes the notion of dynamic stability. So static stability has to do with whether you will blow up or just come back after a while. If you came back after a while, it's statically stable. Dynamic stability has to do with how you're coming back. Are you coming back fast enough? Are you coming back without a, an exaggeration of an overshoot, like you just oscillate with a large amplitude in the middle that you destroy things? So if you come back nicely, then this is dynamically stable system, okay? If you come back fast enough, without too much overshoot, without destroying things, then this is dynamic. So this is the difference between static stability and dynamic stability. Any question about the difference? So what is the requirement for static stability? For any system, is simply to have a spring. What is the spring in my, what are the springs in my airplane in the three degrees of freedom, rotational degrees of freedom? These are the springs. So what are the physical components of the airplane that provide the spring action? Here are they, the hydral, horizontal tail, vertical tail. It's a very important discussion. Questions? Uh, I had a really quick question, Professor. Yep. Um, could you scroll down just like a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the oscillatory behavior for the, uh, the system that is stable, uh at least statically um yeah that's right uh is there any case where we don't because it looks like there's is there always going to be overshoot in that case or is there some case where we're under damped where it does or, or yeah, is that, that just that's, that, that, that's a very good question so this is the point from here i cannot tell what i can tell here is that this system is statically stable is it dynamically oh, okay. stable i really cannot tell i have to study the system in more detail to 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 say anything about dynamic stability. This is a very important question because 
Now, a system can be statically stable, but not dynamically stable, which means it will eventually come back to its equilibrium, but it's coming back in a way that is completely unsatisfactory. It's taking one hour to come back, okay? Okay, so thank you. So, in stating the objectives, really, and this motivates the objectives, while we're doing part one, we're done. We, we, we designed our airplane to be stable and everything is fine. In part one, in part two, I'm sorry, the objectives are, one of the very first objectives is to uh, do dynamic stability. Maybe assess dynamic stability. I cannot just, so the static stability analysis is not sufficient. We have to see how the airplane is coming back. And is it satisfactory or not? If it's not, we have to do something about it. Okay, how do we study this dynamic stability? How do we study the time the system takes to come back to its equilibrium? Let's see, let's see here something. So uh, this mass spring system is always how, what is the response of this guy? What happens when you push this mass to the right or to the left one centimeter? Well, it will keep oscillating indefinitely. And how it comes back to its equilibrium? It always comes back to its equilibrium. If we attach a damper, you have to damp the motion. You have to add a damper. See, oops, okay. So let's add this. So we always add a damper. So spring on its own cannot do anything about dynamic stability. Spring ensures static stability for any system, any system. These concepts that I'm talking about today and over the next few lectures, actually several lectures, are valid for any system. We're talking about submarine, spacecraft, robot system, it doesn't matter. Any system, you have a stiffness, you have spring, you ensure static stability. You need to ensure dynamic stability, you need to add damping. How you add damper? Well, it can be a physical damper like the car, and it can be using other means because also spring, it can be a physical spring like the car, and here you can add it by other means. We really add stiffness or spring by these components, right? It really depends on your system. So we need to add damping. So uh, in order to assess dynamic stability, I must account, must account or so the objectives here is to account for damping in all directions. Right? So far we have been playing, it seems now today we learned that, it seems that we have been playing with springs only. All these requirements are just based on ensuring enough spring action. Okay. They are not sufficient for dynamic stability. We need to add damping. Okay, we need to derive expression for the damping coefficients. These are the stiffness coefficients. We need to derive expressions for the damping coefficients of the airplane. So this would, would be, I mean, like very, uh, one of our main objectives and main contributions in part two. And, and I like this part, so I, I, will, I will always ask about it in, in quizzes, in homework and final. <laughs> So, um, all right, so now we have stiffness and damper in all direction. Does this ensure stability? And this is a very important point, let's see. So we said that stiffness alone for a single degree of freedom ensures static stability. And it seems that here is a stiffness and damper, whatever. This is mass one, A one, C one. A necessary and sufficient condition, mathematically, a necessary and sufficient condition for the stability, dynamic stability <clears throat> of this mass is to have positive K and C. So just give me a strong enough spring and strong enough damper, I guarantee stability for this single degree of freedom system. So uh, for this thing in the wind tunnel, give me a spring and damper, I'm done. I'm sure that it's stable and I'm happy. 
So this is an essential sufficient condition from both considerations, physics and mathematics. So later on, we will see that mathematics actually give us that this is an essential and sufficient condition for stability of this guy is to have positive K and C, i.e. physical K and C. Any physical spring and damper come with positive constants. And also the physics gave the same result. Physics say if whenever you have a mass spring number system, of course it's stable. Okay, what if now, if we add more stabilizing elements, so more stiffness, so I'm adding more stability here, look at that, that's nice, adding stability mass to, I'm adding stability, but I'm adding stability uh, with the more degrees of freedom. So I'm adding stability. Now this is K3, C3, and this was K2, C2. So again, I'm stressing the fact that for a single degree of freedom, the black system, a necessary and sufficient condition for stability is simply to have a spring and damper. Fine. For multi-degree of freedom system, because now I have X here and X and Y there. So this is multi-degree of freedom system, many degrees of freedom, several. It's not only one. It's not enough. It's not sufficient for stability that you have stiffness and damping in all directions so for an airplane in flight we have six degrees of freedom if even if we ensured stiffness in all directions and damping in all directions individually together they may interact together that results in total instability for the entire system it's a very important and interesting fact any question about that So we need not just intuition, like not just oh, stiffness and damping will ensure stability. This is intuition. We need a rigorous mathematical theory to assess our stability. So one of the third objectives, one of the most important objectives is to assess. So um, uh, what I'm going to say, so um, rigorous mathematical analysis of the stability of all degrees of freedom combined together when we combine them together how can we study stability it's not just having spring and amber we need a theory we need just a, a condition just a mathematical condition. Check this, the system is stable. If it doesn't satisfy, the system is unstable, period, for any system, right? And you guys know this. I mean, if you have taken 170, very clear. So these are the, like, uh, like overview, the objectives. Any question about the objectives? So I'm trying to motivate part two because it's really, it's really a new thing. Uh, I'm trying to motivate that. Um, professor? Yes, please. So oh, for your diagram with the like the three uh, different mass or the two different masses. Um, yeah. Okay. Would that correspond to like an ODE with the like three degrees of rotation? Like, is this the all encompassing? Like, it's yeah, it will be a, an ODE with three degrees of freedom, say X, Y, and Z, or X1, X2, and Y, whatever. So let's say X, Y, and Z degrees of freedom. Uh -huh. So, um, this will mean uh, three ODEs, each has uh, double dots. So X double dot, Y double dot, Z double dot, right? Oh, okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. More questions? Okay, fine. So how, how and, and we need, again, these objectives are very legitimate objectives for a spacecraft. If, if we are in a spacecraft attitude control course, which we un unfortunately we don't have in our school due to the, the you know, lack of professors in the field. So, uh, you know, please go and complain. <laughs> anyway, um, we will do exactly the same. We will start by, well, we need to assess static stability, dynamic stability, account for damming in all directions. We need a theory to uh, do the stability analysis. We will really do the same. Nothing will change. 
So let's start. Okay, here is our objective. Let's start. What's the first step in any of this? If you have a spacecraft, if you have a submarine, if you have a car, if you have your airplane, what is the very first step? First, equations of motion. Simply, how can I study a system without writing the equations of motion? Now we have neural networks, people that uh, they claim that they can do things without governing equation, without f equals ma. Good luck for them. So equations of motion, the very first step. Again, this is really generic for spacecraft, submarine, doesn't matter. After you get the equations of motion, we need to analyze balance, equilibrium, which in airplane flight mechanics, we have a special name for it, and I don't know why it's called trim, right? Summation all forces equal zero, summation all moments equal zero, and we ensure this balance at the desired condition. If we want to do cruise, we want to ensure that summation all forces equal zero, summation all moments equal zero at the desired cruise condition, the desired speed and desired altitude. So why isn't there a damping factor for the second case? Uh, what do you mean, Ethan, for the second case? Where, what second case? This one or an old question. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. So, balance equilibrium. We, ins we ensure balance, so we have the equations of motion. So we, what's the equations of motion? Force equal mass times acceleration. So we ensure that submission all forces equal zero, the forces that we identified at the desired condition. Now we ensured balance or equilibrium. Third, what's the third step? And again, guys, please take this as steps for any dynamical system you like to analyze. Quadcopter, helicopter, whatever, okay? Any flying taxi, it does not matter. Any system you like, you take these steps with you. Three, we ensured balance, good. What's the next step? Stability of that equilibrium. And for some reason, many people just confuse these two concepts together. And I'm going to spend like one minute stressing this. These are two independent concepts in the following sense. Balance means what? Balance means summation all forces equal zero, summation all moments equal zero, which means what? Which means no change from that position. This is why we call it equilibrium. Equilibrium position means what? If you start there, right there, exactly there, you will remain there indefinitely. So these two pendulum, this is one and this is an inverted one. These two are both equilibrium positions. So uh, obviously if I start right down, if nothing changes, you know, I'll, I'll remain indefinitely there. What about up? Well, if I start exactly at this position, I will remain there indefinitely. The weight here, mg of this mass, passes through the hinge, so creates no moment, so no tendency to move. If you start exactly right there, you will remain indefinitely. This is equilibrium. What about stability? Stability has to do if you start with a little bit deviation from that equilibrium. This equilibrium position of the bottom pendulum, if you give a little bit disturbance to the right or to the left, what will happen? Well, it will come back. So it's a stable equilibrium. Over there, if you start a little bit deviation from that equilibrium, what will happen? Well, theta will increase all the way and the pendulum will come down. So which means that you will not come back to this equilibrium position, which means that it's not a stable equilibrium. So balance equilibrium, versus stability these are two independent notions any question about that so first step write down the equations of motion second ensure your balance or equilibrium at the desired at the desired operating condition that you like you ensure the equilibrium you ensure the balance well study the stability of that equilibrium after you ensured it you study the stability and it's stable and fine. 
very good now stable what do you mean by stable that if it's perturbed a little bit because in reality in 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 real world environment it, things cannot operate without disturbance disturbance are unavoidable right so you want to make sure if a disturbance comes my system naturally without the interference of the operator it will come back to its equilibrium and resist and reject this disturbance this is the concept of stability fine if the system is stable now i also need to make sure that i as an operator for the airplane i as an as a pilot or for the drone i as the designer of the autopilot have the ability to intentionally deviate from that equilibrium yes i managed to achieve cruise but i want to do maneuvers from the cruise right so i want to make sure that i have controllability of my system in these steps are universal for any system i want to make sure that i have controllability if you remember for our system controllability around the three axes actually uh, mandated that we add these three control surfaces elevator to do pitch up and down from equilibrium rather to do yaw right and left aileron to do roll uh, right and left okay so uh, for any system in general you need to make sure that you the system is controllable you can deviate you can do maneuvers around this equilibrium any questions so far finally everything is fine and your system is controllable which means that you can control it so design a controller if needed design a feedback controller i want to say if needed because really most of the time in industry you really don't need a feedback controller the system is naturally good and indeed our uh, you know airplanes in the past in the 30s we did not need feedback control they were very well designed so that they are naturally have the best performance or the at least the desired performance at the time now there is a lot of emphasis on the feedback control which is which is fine but indeed not every system will need a feedback control many of them they need why they need because they may be unstable so they need feedback controller to stabilize what about if they are stable but not enough well again you need feedback controller to uh, to augment stability hence the name stability augmentation systems and control augmentation systems and so on and so forth. these are the steps that we're going to go uh, every one of these steps we will go in detail in this course in particular today has to do with the very first step writing down the equations of motion any question about these steps All right, guys, so let's do the equations of motion together. For this, I need, um, yeah, probably I need this. Until here. So I need this. Uh, these are my axes. The velocity uh, vector is simply UVW along these axes, which means that my velocity vector is simply UV and W, right? The forces, if I'm gonna write the force as a vector, it's large X, large Y, large Z. The angular velocity, so these are new animals that we are defining today. We, are, we, we have seen UVW before, but we did not see PQR, I guess. So PQR are the components of the angular velocity vector. So similar to the fact that UVW are the components of my velocity vector in 3D, the airplane as a rigid body, it can translate, move with the velocity V. Here are its components. It also can rotate. So it has an angular velocity component, an angular velocity vector. Its components are simply PQR. So simply P is the roll rate. 
the roll angular velocity. Q is the pitching angular velocity. R is the yaw angular velocity. In this sense, since Q is the pitching angular velocity, my omega kind of thing about the Y, how it relates to theta here? What's the relation between Q, which is the pitching angular velocity, and theta? What's the relation? Anybody can suggest? Theta dot? Exactly, right? Q is the D by DT for theta. I don't want to write it here because here there is no Q yet. So Q is simply, uh, I'm just saying this not to uh, like uh, be tempted, be, you know, timid when you see these and, and, and uh, they are nothing new. It's just the rate of change of our angles, okay? All right, so I have my linear velocity vector, angular velocity vector. I have forces X, Y, Z. I have moments L, M, N. We have seen these before. So we're ready to write down the equations of motion, which is nothing but F equals M, A. So the equation of motion is, so this is my first step, equations of motion. Simply the force vector is D by DT of MV. Any question about my main governing equation? Any question? All right, if this is the case, I'll give also the example, the motivating example that I had in the lecture, which is if you have, if you have an airplane, oops, if you have an airplane, and please accept that this is an airplane, and uh, it moves with a velocity along the x axis u. And it moves along this circular path. And U is fixed. U is 100 meters per second. And I ask you what is D. So here we're going to simply take mass out because it's constant. And why mass is constant while the airplane is losing its halfway during the excursion? The answer is simply because we're doing analysis around a short period of time. We're interested to see if the airplane is perturbed, will it come back or not? This happens over a short span of time where the airplane mass can be fairly assumed to be constant. If I want to do a long time simulation for the entire uh, trip, then mass must be varying and I must keep it inside. In a standard flight dynamic analysis, we always take the mass out, okay? So uh, I have, now the force is mass times the acceleration, the usual equation of motion that we are all familiar with. And I'm asking you about the acceleration. What is the acceleration, dv by dt? Is it simply u dot, v dot, w dot, or something else? In the following sense, if u dot, if u, v, and w are constant speeds, which means u dot, v dot, w dot are zeros, does this mean zero acceleration, total acceleration? So here is a scenario where u is constant, so u dot will be zero. And I'm asking you about the dv by dt. When u, v, w are zeros, is dv by dt zero? In this particular scenario, u is constant and the airplane is moving along this circular path. What about dv by dt? Is it zero or not? No. No, you still have angular acceleration. Exactly. So, as you guys said, the answer is simply big no. Why? Because V is a vector. I mean, I actually put this vector or at the top to emphasize that it's indeed a vector. A vector has a magnitude and direction. Your magnitude may be constant, like you're saying, but the direction is changing. If the direction is changing, I have to account for its change, right? Because d by dt means what? d by dt means rate of change. So rate of change for a vector is two things, actually. Is the rate of change of the magnitude. So this is u dot, v dot, and w dot. Or what, say, let's, let's say this is v dot, okay? I'm going to write it like this. But there is a rate change of direction. 
So maybe uh, 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 the V dots are zero. So I need to add something for the change of the direction, the rotation of the direction by some angular velocity. There is a derivation for this, and you may have seen it before. If not, I mean, we can uh, discuss it in the discussion. Uh, but it's simply omega cross the vector. What, what am I saying here? Am I saying the following? I'm saying the following. If you have any vector A that is written in a, a moving, a rotating frame, okay, a rotating axis, remember this U, little u, Vw, they are components in the body axis. And these body axes, they rotate with the body. Look at the x-axis here. It was horizontal at the beginning, but when the body rotated, now it rotates with the body. So these axes rotate as we move, as the airplane move and fly. They rotate with the airplane. So these axes are rotating axes. So these components are in a rotating frame, in rotating axes. So maybe they are constants themselves, but the axes are rotating. Okay. So if you have a vector that is written in a rotating axis and you want to get dA by dt, it is always any vector, any vector in, in your mathematics. It is always two components. A dot just differentiate its components in that axis plus an effect of rotation. Omega of the axis cross the vector. This vector can be my velocity vector he, here, V or anything. So when I apply this rule, some, some people call it vector differentiation formula. Probably you have seen it before. When I apply this rule to my velocity vector here, I get the same thing. So dv by dt is differentiate the components plus omega cross v. Uh, any question about this blue statement? Because the rest is easy. The rest I'm going to just substitute. So this is simple. Now my force, I'm going to expand my force as a force in X, force in Y, force in Z. The components is equal to the mass times the acceleration. We have two components. Let's write them in blue. So uh, here I have U dot, V dot, W dot, the rate of changes of the components themselves, plus the effect of rotation. It's a cross product. Do it the way you like. The way I like, I always do the cross product in 3D as determinant so how do we do it well in the first line of the determinant we put i j k this to me means uh, over hat means a unit vector and then we put the components of the first vector you do cross product between two vectors right so put the components of the first vector please the components of omega is simply pqr the components of the second vector, please. The components of V are U, V, W, little u, V, W, right? And compute the determinant. We're done. So my equation of motion, Fx, Fy, Fz is mass times U dot, V dot, W dot plus give you one component of it. Remember, this is a determinant. So you do this and you do that. So you multiply these guys minus the other way around. So this is the first element. So the first element is you cross one, one. So this is QW minus R. The second element, you cross two, two. And the third element, you cross three, three. Uh, so if you cross here, I'm sorry, the, the, the third and this guy, you get PV minus QU of the third. So this is PV minus QU. And the second you cross here and there, you get uh, RU minus PW. And we're done. These are the equations of motion. We're actually done with the equations of motion. Any question about that? Any questions? Wait, Professor, you said that, that that matrix is the determinant? Yeah, the determinant of these things. Oh, wait, so wouldn't it be like a scalar value then? Or is it? Yes, it's.
exactly you're right that that's a very good observation it's a scalar but it's a scalar uh, because you're expanding the determinants with something times i something times j and times something times k whatever times i it represents the first component whatever times j represents the second component and so on and so on. but yes this will be expanded as some term is added together as a scalar but it's not quite scalar why because we have multiplication by i j and k so they are actually vectors do you see what i'm saying yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions? All right, one last thing. One last thing, I mean, on this part. Um, what type of forces, like I wanna expand these forces. What type of forces acting on the airplane? Let's try to get them together. Like, let's try to, what are the types of forces? We have lift drag, right? So we have aerodynamic forces. Uh, we have uh, thrust coming from the engine, so aerodynamics and propulsion, right? And we have gravity. Okay. So you're going to expand fx, fy, fz as large x, large y, large z in green, the aerodynamics. So these things here x y z these are the aerodynamic and propulsion okay forces coming from the aerodynamics and the engine okay and if gravity we know it's just mg straight downward right so i'm gonna write down this equation of motion as the following it's x y and z plus F gravity vector, which is, I know that it's mg straight downward. And I'm gonna say this is equal to whatever I have from here, right? Let's, let's just get this. And these are my final equations of motion. Next time, we'll see how to get the F gravity. And the green ones will come from where? Well, from come from aerodynamic model. Any question about this picture? So this is my final equation of motion for the translational part. Any question? And this is M. All right. The airplane, we're not done. Why? Because the airplane has how many degrees of freedom? Well, it has six degrees of freedom. Three translational and three rotational. Here are the equations of motion governing the three translational. We need similar ones governing the three rotational. They are very similar. We'll do it very similar way and we'll, we'll be really done. So let's do it together. The three rotational equations of motion. It's the same thing here. So what is the, I'm sorry, what is the rotational version of that? What is the rotational analog of this equation? Can we write it here? What is the rotational analog? Well, the force goes by the torque or the moment vector. Here is d by dt. And uh, the mass, what is the rotational analog of the mass? Any suggestion? Inertia. Exactly, I, and the rotational analog of V is simply omega. So I'm gonna copy this red equation down. So tau is d by dt of I omega. So I omega now is a vector, that's fine. And again, is a vector represented in the body axis. So please, when you do d by dt, take care of the rotation of the body axis. Nothing more than this simple vector differentiation formula. So let's apply, please. So this is what? d by dt for any vector is the vector dot, whatever the vector name. So it's i omega dot plus 
Omega cross the vector, whatever the vector is. So omega cross the vector. The vector again is I omega. So let me even do this. Right. You guys get this. Any question about this statement? So the moment is the rate of change of angular momentum, like the force rate of change of linear momentum. The moment is rate of change of angular momentum. If linear momentum is mass times velocity, angular momentum is mass moment of inertia times angular velocity. Simply the angular or the rotational analog of that. And now I have d by dt for any vector. And this vector is represented in a rotating axis. Well, I'm going to apply this blindly. My a now is simply i omega. That's it. Questions? OK, what's i omega? What is i? So omega, we know, uh, indeed. Omega here is omega. It's pqr components, right? Like uvw, we have pqr. Fine. What is i? Moment of inertia. So. Uh, this is a rigid body. It has many mo several moments of inertia, at least three around the three axes. And I'm going to remind you, so I'm going to digress here a little bit. I'm going to remind you of the following. So whenever we have force equal mass times acceleration, indeed, the mass is a measure of the resistance against motion. Why? Because if I want to give this mass some acceleration, uh, I have to exert a force, right? F. And the larger the mass, the larger the force, right? So you need to exert a larger force if you have a larger mass. So the mass actually, how a given body resists resists me in pushing it. Well, it resists by its mass. So what about if I have a body and I want to rotate? So I have a torque. What property by which the body is resisting rotation? It's not the mass. It is the mass moment of inertia, right? So because what's the mass moment of inertia? Well, it's mass times distance squared. So maybe the mass is small, but it's distributed over a large distance. So you have a large moment of inertia. Not only that, a body will have at least, like I said, three moments of inertia, about the three axes. So it will resist you in rotation differently for the three axes. It may be easier to move to rotate the body about one axis than another. And indeed for the airplane, it is the case. When you consider the rotation about, about this, which is rotation about X, right? This is the easiest rotation and you can really feel it. You can really feel that it is easier to rotate the airplane. If you just push here a little bit, the wings, it, the airplane will rotate. Whereas in the other axis, it may not be as easy. Okay. So uh, let's see questions here. Yes, theta double dot angular acceleration. Thank you. So this means that we have several moments of inertia. I'm just, uh, and I'm sure that you guys have seen this before. So here is the inertia for a rigid body is not just a scalar, unlike the mass. The inertia for a rigid body is actually a matrix. Here is the matrix. It's I, X, X. I, Y, Y over the diagonal, I, Z, Z, negative I, X, Y, products of inertia, negative I, X, Z, negative I, Y, Z, and so on. So, and it's a symmetric matrix. So this comes here, this comes there, and this also comes there, negative I, X, Z. Of course, these things, I, X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z, they are uh, always positive because here it's their definition. It's the integral of the other dimensions. If it's x, x, so it's y squared plus z squared. If it's y, y, so it's x squared plus z squared. And z, z, it's the integral of uh, x squared plus y squared. 
and the products of inertia x y for example is simply x times y dm and if you put y z you put y z and so and so all right so uh, we have uh, we have an inertia matrix for the airplane and again this is for a for a uh, spacecraft submarine whatever we always have a, an inertia matrix fine but there is something for the airplane that distinguishes here we're gonna make a specification for the airplane which is the following that the xz plane is a plane of symmetry what do you mean so we mean the following All right, so this is X body, CG, Y body, and look at this thing, for example, I, X, Y. How do you get this I, X, Y? Well, we we uh, divide the airplane into chunks and each chunk for this one, for example, we multiply its mass M times its X coordinate times Y coordinate together. And then integral means summation. We must, we, we sum this multiplication, this product for all chunks in the airplane. The issue is because of the symmetry, anything that has some Y we will have its peer with the exact same mass and exact same everything in negative y. So in particular, this thing, the peer is here, is the exact same. This chunk will have the same chunk there and so and so. So when you sum them, them together, it's the same mass, same x, but one with positive y, one with negative y, they will cancel each other. So the result, because of the symmetry, symmetry about the xz plane, so symmetry about xz plane. So anything with positive y, which is normal to the xz plane, anything with positive y has its corresponding corresponding with negative y. So anything that has y in it, i x y or i y z will be zero. So the inertia matrix of the airplane is special in this regard in the following sense that the inertia matrix is, so I X Y is zero, I Y Z is zero. So we have this cross of, of zeros. So only I X Z is non-zero and sometimes it's actually a small value. So I have here I X X, I Y Y, I Z Z, you can write X X or just X for short. So all what I want to convince you is that this is my inertia matrix. Any question about that? Since for us, it's just a given for us now that any airplane will come with this inertia matrix. So uh, if you want to give me the inertial properties of the airplane, give me four numbers, IX, IY, IZ, and IXZ. We know automatically that the other two numbers are zeros. Any question about that? So if this is the case, because now I, I know the structure of my I matrix. So please get that vector I times omega. That's easy. Here is my matrix I X, I Y, I Z. And these are zeros in the cross. This is I X Z, this is I X Z. And I'm gonna multiply this with the omega vector, which is simply PQR. So this gives you what? Let's do the multiplication. This is IXP minus IXZR. Let's find this is IYQ. And this is IXZP plus IZR. So I got the I omega vector. Fine. Let's apply this rule blindly and we're done. So let's apply it. What is our torque vector, the left-hand side? Well, the torque or the moment vector is here. We know it from before. It's just LMN components. LMN. Any idea these moments? When I say moment, there must be implicitly some point because we cannot compute moment in general. It has to be around a point. 
Any idea what point what point was talking about? Uh, center of gravity. Exactly. Very good. So these moments are about the center of gravity. So torque or moments about the center of gravity, LMN equals the first term here is simply uh, derivatives of, of the component of I omega. So that's easy. I'm gonna copy this black vector with dots all over. So I X P dots, I X Z R dot. Of course, I'm not, not doing dot over the I's because they are constant. They are just numbers, right? I Y Q dot. And uh, we're done with the first plus, we're done with the first term plus the second. Here is the second, what's the second? It's omega cross. Fine, the cross product, I do it by determinant. The first row of the determinant is I, J, and K. The second row is the components of the first vector, omega. What are the components of omega? Simply P, Q, R. And then the third is what is the components of the second vector, I omega. The components of I omega, here are the components of I omega. So uh, it's I X P minus I X Z R. It's I Y Q, yada, yada, P e plus I Z R. Do the determinant on your pace, fine and add them together it's it's just a, a matter of maybe a couple of more minutes to arrive at the equations of motion here lmn lmn on one hand p dot q dot r dot on the other hand and the cross terms that are coming from here here are the equations of motion one question one question for you guys here the forces we uh, the forces here we made them in two contributions one in green coming from aerodynamic and propulsion and one coming from gravity why we are not doing the same for the moments why we are not doing it one from aerodynamic and propulsion and something from gravity in particular Actually, LMN are the aero and propulsion. Where the gravity went? Any idea? Is it because there's no moment created from center of gravity? Exactly. Very good. Because simply the gravity force acts on or at the center of gravity. So there is no moment about the center of gravity. Very good. So LMN are the moments also due to aerodynamic and propulsion. So they will come from the same model, from the same similar equations. Uh, so the same aerodynamic model will give us forces and moments. Fine. So now let's put all the equations together. I'm gonna recall this. So we can get them from above or from the lecture, whatever you like. I'm just gonna put them all together now. Uh, why? Because these are the six equations of motion in the six unknowns. This represent my dynamics. Let me let me see here. So this is this set, right? This set is as follows. Actually, do we have a picture here? We don't have a picture. That's fine. We can draw a picture together. So this set. Let's see. This is my rigid body dynamics which is applicable to what to your airplane to spacecraft to submarine to your car to flying taxi to whatever what are the inputs here the inputs like any dynamics problem are forces and moments x or let me put them in the general form like this is fx fy fz right these are the forces and also the moments l m and n so give me forces and moments dynamics give you what dynamics give you the motion so velocities u v w after integration p q r linear velocities and angular velocity 
So this is always dynamics. Given the load, here is the motion. And the, the type of dynamics that we're using is rigid body dynamics. Unlike the performance class 158, the dynamics that you guys use over there is simply point mass. So you have only three equations of motion, not six. What is the next step? Well, the next step is obvious, is to get this from where? Any idea? These are coming from where? Forces and moments. Aerodynamics, right? So an aerodynamic model that gives you the aerodynamic forces and moments. And now when you combine dynamics with aerodynamics, this is airplane flight mechanics, the very first lecture, if you remember, flight mechanics is simply dynamics plus aerodynamics. All right, so next time, I mean, next few lectures, we'll see how to get these forces from an aerodynamic model, combine it with this to have a complete flight dynamic model. Question.